Well, hey, AP, hope you're doing well when you watch this video. This video is about the last section in Chapter 5 as far as modifications of cell services and communication. As always, I'm so proud of all your work and determination to do well. Let's go ahead and get started. So, cell services. We've been talking about the plasma membrane, you know, fluid mosaic model, active and passive transport. And so the last section is all about some anatomy and also cell signaling. So there is something called the extracellular matrix in cells. So it's the stuff around cells. So it's a meshwork of proteins and polysaccharides, you know, sugars, in close connection with the cell that produced them. There's examples of proteins out there like collagen, you know, resist stretching. There's like collagen um, products out there to help reduce lines. Elastin, which provides resilience to ECM. Integrin, which is a protein that plays a role in cell signaling, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then finally, proteoglycans. It rel uh, regulates passage of materials through the ECM to the plasma membrane. So this is kind of how the anatomy looks. And let me take off the writing here. Okay, so here's how the anatomy looks. So you can see outside, this is inside the cell, outside the cell, and you can see integrin and um, collagen and proteoglycans and all this. So this is the extracellular matrix, okay? And it can vary in quantity and consistency. For example, in bone, you see them as hard and makes up most of the tissue. In cartilage, it's flexible. You know, obviously, if you feel your you know, forearm, bones, radius, and ulna versus your ear, you can tell the difference. And then an epithelial tissue, you know, two, uh, three layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis, mostly cells. So there's very little ECM there as far as epithelial tissue. So there's junctions between cells, and this is some more anatomy as far as cells go, but you would definitely need to know, I would definitely know these junctions. So adhesion junctions, attaches two adjacent, adjacent cells. So adhesion, of course, stick together. So for example, desmosomes, I don't know if you watched the, uh, my video on organelles, but I talked about them and their role in, in heart disease, um, ARVD specifically. And so these are very important that they are formed correctly. Tight junctions form impermeable barriers. Okay, so they prevent leakage. They do not let anything cross at all. And then gap junctions, which, of course, by the name, you can tell these are channels. So these allow communications. And the communications, as that happens as far as signaling goes. Um, you know, signaling as far as molecules. And that's how many things communicate, through signals. So the next slide is about plasma desmata in plant cells. So if you look on the anatomy here, you can see plasma membrane, um, cell wall, and then you have the cell wall there, and then cytoplasm, cytoplasm, but plasmids desmata, and this is underneath a transmission electron microscope, I believe, they have freely permeable cell walls. So plasma desmata penetrate the cell wall. And so they allow, why are they important? Because they allow passage of material between cells. So again, this is a type of gap junction in plant cells. So next we're going to move on to signaling. So signaling, it's, uh, signaling is very important. Of course, cells have to be able to notice the world around them, be aware of the world around them to maintain homeostasis and adapt and change to coordinate that response. So cell to cell communication allows the cells of the body to coordinate their activities. Communication between cells is also essential for many unicellular organisms. So it doesn't matter if you're made of one cell or many cells, this is essential to life. Okay, so what exactly is cell signaling? Cell signaling is the process where cells can process information from the environment. Again, we're trying to figure out what the environment, how has it changed, and how do we need to respond. So a stimulus evokes a response, a change. And so signals include physical stimuli, like heat or light, and chemicals. These are called ligands. Following reception activation by a signal, this is very important right here. A signal transduction pathway is initiated. I'm going to draw a star. I'm writing with a mouse, so I've got to get me like a writing pad. <laughs> but a sequence of events that lead to a cellular response. Um, so let's let me take off the writing right here. And so there's different types of signals. There's autocrine, affect the same cells that release them. There's paracrine, which diffuse to and affect nearby cells. So this an, an example would be nerve cells. Juxtacrine requires direct contact between signaling and the responding cell. And then hormones 
travel to very distant cells. There's also a special type of signaling in the animal nervous system. This is called synaptic signaling, and it consists of an electrical signal moving along a nerve cell that triggers secretion of neurotransmitter molecules. That's how you're hearing and, and learning right now. That's how I'm speaking right now and trying to click a mouse and draw with a mouse at the same time. Synaptic signaling allows uh, all that in neuromuscular junctions with how the cell, um, nerve cell uh, communicates with muscular tissue. So here's just a picture here of, of uh, sorry, the um, different types of signaling. Sorry, I was like, man, I, I'm trying to like get used to the writing as well. So autocrine, same cell, so it's just same cell. Juxcrine, direct contact. Paracrine, it's a nearby cell, not crazy far. But then sometimes we secrete molecules that travel in like bloodstreams or all over you know, the body to go to target cells. And that would be an example of signal, circulating signals such as hormones, okay? So moving on, going to skip a few slides here. Um, so only cells with the necessary response or necessary receptors can respond to a signal. The target cell must be able to sense it and respond to it. Does that make sense? If there's a signal around, you have to be able to receive that signal. So a signal transduction pathway involves a signal, again, I would know this, a signal, a receptor, and a response. And it involves those three. So Earl W. Sutherland kind of discovered this by um, investigating hormone epinephrine, which is involved in the fight or flight response. And so reception, detection of the signal, transduction, which is conversion of the signal to a cellular response. Again, we don't just need to know the signals there. We need to respond to what that signal is, you know, that message that signal is carrying. And then, of course, the cellular response. So we've got to respond appropriately to keep this. So this slide right here, which I'll go over in class, is extremely important. I've seen this, this picture or formation of uh, form of this picture on the AP exam. So you have reception. So you have some sort of signaling molecule, right? receptor it binds and then because of that binding form leads to function right so the form has changed therefore the function has changed so sometimes there's an activated protein because of this sometimes channels open who knows but there is transduction so these relay molecules there's molecules that get activated and, and then activate different molecules and then activate different molecules and eventually because all these molecules are now activated they're doing different things because they have different form then we get to our response so we could, you know, activation of glycogen phosphorylase, we could activate a protein, we could make a protein or, or turn off the making of a protein. So cell signaling is at the heart of maintaining homeostasis for cells. This is just another picture right here. You have the cell signal molecule receptor. Then you have activated signal molecules, which activate other types of molecules. Short term, you could maybe activate an enzyme or move a cell. Long term, you could maybe alter gene expression. So making a completely different molecule or turning off. Um, the production of a different molecule. All of that is examples of signal transduction. So signal transduction pathways often include allosteric regulation. So the protein shape changes as a result of molecule binding to a site other, see this is the key, other than the active site. So this is allosteric binding. We talked about this when we talked about enzymes, but the shape changes. But the regulatory molecule, that's activation, okay? So you can either activate it or deactivate it. You can either turn it on or turn it off um, as well. So receptors can be classified by their location. You can have intracellular receptors located inside of a cell, and then membrane receptors located on the surface. They have large or polar ligands that cannot diffuse across the membrane. This, an example, that would be insulin. An example of an intracellular one would be like steroids, like testosterone or estrogen. Um, those diffuse, those need to be able to go inside the cell because that's where their receptors are. Reversible binding is important because cells need to stop responding, again, maintaining homeostasis, right, to a signal after the appropriate response has occurred. So inhib inhibitors or antagonists, this is where our caffeine molecule comes into play, it's an antagonist of adenosine, can bind in place of the normal ligand. So there's good old caffeine, you know, preventing binding of the normal ligands, therefore you stay awake. Receptors are also classified by their activity. So there's three different types of receptors, ion channels, protein kinase and G protein linked. So you don't have to know too much in depth with these. I would just know in general that ion channel receptors are ligand gated ion channels. So they change shape when a ligand binds. So for example, acetylcholine receptors on skeletal muscle cells bind acetylcholine to open the channel and allow sodium to diffuse in. So here's a picture here. 
ion channel unoccupied. It binds. Confirmation is changed. And then it's open. Let's things through. Then you go back to the original state. Protein kinase, I do want you to know the definition of protein kinase because it modifies proteins, again, formally to function, by adding phosphate groups. So not all protein kinases are receptors, little, you know, footnote there, but protein kinase receptors also change shape. So again, form leads to function. I keep saying it, but here's an example. This is very uh, <laughs> pixelated, but you can see ATP to ADP. We're losing a phosphate. Now we have a phosphorylated protein. So an example here from a different book is you have your signaling molecule and then activate relay molecule. And that relay molecule activates the protein kinase. And then that protein kinase is activated and that protein kinase is activated. And that's the goal. We're trying to get a cellular response right there. So that's called a phosphorylation cascade. A series of different proteins in a different pathway are phosphorylated, which means adding a phosphate in turn. So each protein adding a phosphate group to the next one in line. And then finally, G protein. They expose a site that combines to a memory protein called a G protein. And so the, it's really better to look at this visually. So here you go. You have a G protein linked receptor. Here's an inactive G protein. It's activated by GTP, which is like similar to ATP for our purposes. So the hormone bond, you know, signal binds, activates G protein. And then that activates another, you know, membrane protein. And that protein, because of that, activates many different responses. So again, another picture here. You see the signaling molecules activated the receptor. We activated the G protein. And then now we activated an enzyme. So G proteins are super important. I mean, even here, you don't have to know this slide at all, but just they're, they're involved in cancer initiation and progression. Now, this is from a research article that I found a couple of years ago. Um, they contribute to the establishment of the microenvironment which is permissive for tumor formation and growth. So they're considered to be among the use, most useful drug targets. I mean, we can shut these things down. We could possibly stop cancer in its tracks, which is crazy to think about. So intracellular receptors, we already talked about those, the cytoplasm or the nucleus. So smaller hydrophobic chemical messengers can rarely cross. Small or hydrophobic, which means nonpolar. Okay, they're afraid of water, so that means nonpolar. Nitrous oxide is an example of that. does many different things. So again, here's another picture here. So you have your hormone aldosterone. It can go through. Its receptors are on the inside. So now it binds to its receptor, hormone receptor complex. That enters the nucleus and binds to specific genes. We turn on the production of different genes, make new proteins, and so that's how we get our response. So that's pretty, um, the difference between steroids and polar ligands where they bind to their receptors so signal activation for a specific receptor leads to a cellular response again that's um, considered a signal transduction pathway so it's a cascade of protein which basically means one protein activates 10 and those 10 proteins activate 100 and and so the the, pro the reason we learn this is because the signal one molecule we need to amplify and distribute that signal okay that's what we need to do so Cells change in response to signals. They can open ion channels. They can upregulate or downregulate um, of genes, you know, the production of proteins. They can alter enzyme activity. A great example is the EpiPen. I mean, epinephrine is a hormone our body produces, but if someone's having an allergic reaction, they need that because it opens the lungs, it increases blood pressure, and then it basically reverses anaphylactic shock. Okay, but this, that, those are, when you inject epinephrine, those are Ligands, those are chemical messengers, and it tell, it has a specific role at specific cells. Um, it actually um, dilates you know, airways because when you have an anaphylactic shock, your blood pressure drops and you constrict your airways, and so we need to do the opposite. The same signal can lead to different responses in different types of cells. Epinephrine does different things in different places. So the extracellular signal molecule called a ligand that binds the receptor is a pathway's first messenger. So second messengers... So the first one is the ligand. Okay, that's the one that first binds. The second messenger are small non-protein water-soluble okay, molecules or ions that spread throughout a cell by diffusion. So good old CAMP is like the famous example here. Um, cyclic AMP, monophosphate. So CAMP is an example of a widely used second messenger. So adenylate, 
cyclase, an enzyme in the plasma membrane, rapidly converts ATP to CAMP. The immediate effect of CAMP is usually the activation of protein kinase, okay, A, which then phosphorylates, adding phosphates to a variety of other proteins. So let me show you a picture here. <coughs> Excuse me. So first messenger, there's your epinephrine, G protein, okay. Activate G protein, activate then a little cyclase. I think I'm saying that right. And then ATP, that, you know, rapidly converts that to CAMP. But CAMP now activates another protein, kinase, and that leads to the response. So here's the biggest thing to know. This is a series of steps. If CAMP's not around, this protein's not activated, and the cellular responses don't happen. So CAMP has to be around for that protein kinase to activate. And so that's just an example of a secondary um, uh, messenger. So again, they would later dis be discovered CAMP. Second messengers regulate target enzymes by binding to them non-covalently, which means they're reversible. So they allow the cell to respond to a single membrane event with many events. So this is amplification, horrible line drawing. <laughs> and so ampl amplification, so more than once. So this is just a picture of what that reaction looks like. ATP would go down to cyclic AMP. And then this is what Sutherland was studying. So one molecule of epinephrine, and this is what's crazy about amplification on a cellular level. One molecule, you have your receptor, activates a G protein, activates this, there's our good old camp, second messenger. And so it activates protein, activates the protein kinase, that um, shuts down glycogen synthesis, synthase, preventing glucose from being stored as glycogen. Why do we prevent glucose from being stored as glycogen? Because epinephrine is a fight or flight molecule. When epinephrine's around, your body thinks it's in trouble. You're trying to live. You're trying to fight for your life or flee for your life or something for your life. And so we need all the energy we can. And so glucose is that energy. Glucose through this process of cellular respiration makes all ATP. So we don't need anything to be stored right now. We need, we need all the fuel reserves open because we are fighting for our life. And so then we activate another phosphorylase kinase. So here for every molecule of epinephrine, about 20 molecules of CAMP are made. I mean, these are just rough numbers, of course, but one to 20. Then we got a hundred molecules down here. Then we have a thousand active glycogen phosphorylases. Okay. Releasing stored glucose molecules from glycogen. So this breaks down glycogen. So glycogen, glucose one phosphate. So you have 10,000 molecules of glucose to help with our fire or flight response. So for every one molecule of epinephrine, that 10,000 glucose molecules roughly being released. And I'm sure you could just imagine how many molecules are in an EpiPen or when your body releases it. So that is an example of a fire or flight response. There's different responses. Okay, here's your nuclear one, growth factor. Okay, you know, human growth hormone receptor. There's our cascade transduction, right? Reception, transduction, and what's our response? Our response is we're activating different genes. We're growing, you know, involved with puberty or involved, you know, with growth or growth plates or, you know, how does the body go from, you know, three feet to six feet over many years? I mean, this, this is it. Reception, transduction, response. Reception, transduction, response. Know those three words. Reception, one more time. Reception, transduction, amplification, right? Distribu distribution, and then cellular response. So signal transduction ends after the cell responds. So enzymes convert transducer back to his inactive precursor. Again, we're maintaining, you know, we're maintaining a balance. This is all about homeostasis, um, being able to respond to the world around us. Um, and this is just, you know, right, active, it's a cycle, active, inactive, active, inactive. So cells can alter the balance of enzymes in two ways. Just, this is just like a wrap up, very broad view summary. We can either make or break down the enzyme or we can activate or inhibit the enzymes by other molecules. So in many ways, signal transduction involves enzymes. I mean, you just saw this. And so we can either make or break down or we can activate or inhibit the enzymes by other molecules. I don't know why I have of there, of the enzyme, not makes sense. Activation or inhibit it of the enzyme. No, that's good. I'm sorry, it's early. Um, so cells can alter the balance of enzymes those two ways. So again, this is the last section in the plasma membrane uh, chapter. 
uh, 5.4 for one book, our book. So I hope this was helpful. Um, hope, uh, you know, you stay encouraged. I mean, God is amazing, right? Just think this, the complexity of all this, and we're just scratching the surface. So again, I'm so proud of you. I uh, appreciate you. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to travel along this journey together. God bless.